Okay, January 11, 2022. All right. United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia, Atlanta Division. Okay, that's my part. Is you still going? Go ahead. Is now in session the Honorable Judge William N. Ray the second presiding. Tamiria. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Please be seated and come to order. All right. Good morning. Little bit late, but I hope y'all understand circumstances. It wasn't that I wasn't up and it's not like I had too much to drink last night because I didn't and I was up early. But when it comes to Georgia winning a championship, that doesn't come around that often. So I was a little bit slow getting getting going. So I apologize for keeping you waiting. I see that I have got the judge, the judge is here. Tanya's here. Okay. okay. You're going to be the other what, way. What page are we on? Page four, page four yeah. number 21. 421? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to take the part of, um, what's her name? What's that lady name? The, the weird, the long name one. Okay. Tamir. Okay. Go ahead, Tanya. 21. Eyes Moldova. That's the one she's going to be. Yeah. I'm my, my that lady. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Tanya. 21. Oh, we're sorry, okay. guys. Um, did this say I see that I'm that I've got a defendant written exhibit list? Is that where we're at? Yes. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see that I that I got a defendant written exhibit list. Yes. Is there one for the is there one for the plaintiffs as, as well? Yes, Your Honor. May I approach, Your Honor? Sure. When y'all need to give me a few things, if you'll just give me give them to me, Ms. Lee, because of logistics, it's just easier. Did the plaintiff file a response last night to the motion filed by the defendant? No, Your Honor. Okay. It was late. I know y'all were busy, so let's just for the record reflect. Just... Okay, I'm sorry. So let's just for the record to reflect, this is the second day of trial. It's gonna be a shorter one, shorter day today. But in any event, I read, I read the plaintiff's motion last night during the first half when things weren't going as well, for, so well for Georgia. So one, sec one second, okay. not one second, Tanya. Everybody is not reading right now. Please mute your phone because there's an echo. Please mute your phone because there's an echo. And I apologize, everyone. I'm having problems with showing the um the actual transcript. I apologize. Go ahead. But in any event, I read the planet's motion last night during the first half when things weren't going so well for Georgia. So I did read it. And I want to ask, um, I certainly want to hear the defendant's, the, um, the planet's response to it. But Ms. Izmalova, is that her name? Yeah, Miss Ismalova. So just, I didn't go back and look at your motion in Lemney from earlier. You were waiting as part of the motion to keep out everything, including the original letter sent by the plaintiff. I'm sorry, Your Honor. You were wanting to keep out everything originally, including the letter sent by the plaintiff to the defendant. I can read it exactly how it was written, if you if your honor would like. Well, if you could just sort of, I mean, I don't need you to read it to me, but just generally speaking, was your aim to keep out everything, the plaintiff's letter to you, your response? When I say you, the pronoun you, I'm referring to the parties, but the defendant's response to the letter as well. As well as the, the whole entire thread, the thread of that conversation like it started with the plaintiff sending their retraction letter and then 
my client's response to to that and then the plaintiff's attorney's response to my client that was the that's what i meant by email corresponding between our client and the plaintiff's counsel and originally did you argue that the reason was because it was part of an offer to compromise i said that the whole conversation should not be admitted because it was all kind of settlement no negotiations well okay now does the tort of defamation requires requirement that there be some demand for retraction the only thing that i know in the statute is that if it matters as far as pun punch uh, punitive uh <laughs> Punitive damage, punitive damages, I'm sorry, are concerned if you know plaintiffs is going to ask for punitive damages. They can use evidence of the fact that they sent a retraction request and whether or not that was, you know, followed or not followed. So unless it's, well, if they're, if that's true, and I'm not saying that it's not, I'm just, um, I don't have defamation suits every day. So I just want to make sure I understand the perimeters. If a requirement for punitive damage begins to authorize, being authorized is, let me back up and say it this way, not a requirement. If a factor about whether or not punitive damages are authorized is whether or not the plaintiff asked for a retraction and didn't receive one and your contention then is that the offer or the demand for retraction is an offer and compromise? Then how would you ever get that into evidence? Your honor. No, I meant like, I'm not saying that we're not going to object to that for the purpose of the punitive damages. We would stipulate that she received the retraction, a demand to retract it what i'm saying is once that was sent that's what started off the conversation about you know settlement negotiations that's what that's when the email started going back and forth so we are not trying to keep it out so that the plaintiffs cannot present the fact that they sent the demand to retract the letter in the letter in and of itself, we will stipulate that she received that, but that's what kicked off the settlement conversation. The party doesn't have to stipulate to anything, right? I mean, like for an example, one side, if they don't want something coming in, can't pretermit uh, pre the opposing party's introduction of evidence by simply saying that we stipulate or we stipulate to that. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen sometimes. I can give you a good example. In a criminal case where there are, well, the best example is it's illegal under federal law to possess a gun if, you're not, if you've been convicted of a felony. Under federal law and under state law in most places. And so, for the gov and so the government has the obligation to prove prior conviction. And so typically what happens is that the defendant and the government stipulates to the prior conviction so that the government doesn't introduce the conviction itself, which can be pretty aggravating if it's a very serious underlying conviction that is typically done. But there are due process issues there because of the unique nature that criminal law has and the fact that someone has, to, has, someone has been convicted of a crime, the prejudice that inherently inherit in that. I would think in the context of slander and libel or defamation generally, that it's pretty standard for demand letters for retractions to be introduced. Your honor, here's the, my preference is this. The only thing that we were, we was said or what uh, we said or sent was that demand letter itself. That's not objectable. And that would be, that would not be, you know, that would be admissible. I'm not even, the demand letter is not the issue in the, in, in, in of itself. 
I only mention it because that's what that's the reason why the email communication began. So if they it's the court. Um well wait a minute. Wait a minute. What part of it then of the chain if you if you so you're saying that you don't have a problem with the demand letter coming in. Is no. that what you're saying? No. Okay. What do you have a problem with? With your response coming in? My client's response. Basically, the communication via email that she was having between herself and the plaintiff's attorney. All right. Give me a, just a second. Okay, Jennifer, I'm looking at the drive. You said you put the in the drive today. Uh-huh. The renewed no motion. What's the docket number? I didn't file it, Your Honor, because it's confidential communication. I'm looking in the wrong thing. Hold a second. Powerful. Is it me? It's in the main folder. You have a copy? Thank you. Thank you. I'm speaking to the defense counsel. Do you recognize that within what you label as Defendant Exhibit 3 to your motion for reconsideration, there are admissions made by the defendant that are certainly re relevant in this lawsuit about what she did or did not know about the things that she, the defendant, was publishing? I read the email. Yes, sir. So you don't think that that's admissible? I don't think that the whole communication is admissible because it is part of the discussion about settlement negotiations. So what well, you're telling me that if someone makes a, if we assume for a moment it's settlement negotiation, and that's pretty broad inter inter interpretation that the defendant applies to this letter, but even so, that if within that, if there's an admissible admission made that goes to an element of the def defense that was being charged, that renders the admission inadmissible. I don't know what that say. Correct. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> What's your law? What law do you have that would say that? I mean, I guess I'm specifically saying that your logic, I get it, but do you have any case law that would say that if in this course of negotiation, if we say that that's what this is, that if someone made a critical admission against interest about the facts that are relevant to the legal dispute, that the admission against interest about those facts and admissible because it's a settlement discussion. I mean, if you don't have any cases, just say you don't. No, I mean, I don't. <laughs> I'm trying to process what your honor says to see if I can think of an argument that's legitimate to state that but i was just more so saying in looking at defendants exhibit three and four together because it was both the communication from my client to them and them to my client it's very clear that this was all talks during settlement negotiation and so that was the motion to reconsider to exclude the whole thread of the conversations all right Anything else you would like to say about your motion? Because I asked Ms. Matz to respond. I'm sorry. Anything else you'd like to say about your motion before I ask Ms. Matz to respond? No, I would just ask the court to consider the full communication because that was the whole point, was that all of the communication was not the first hearing for the some reason, part of the response, the plaintiff's counsel response was not present, presented to the court. So I just wanted the court to view the communication as a whole and determine whether it was or was not, you know, communications about settlement because I think that it is. Um, court. Sorry, my phone was muted. All right, thank you. 
Ms. Matt, your response? Okay. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. So the first thing is, just to take you back to the first pretrial conference, you actually looked at both the demand letter to the demand for retraction that was sent to defend it. It was not an offer of compromise. It's actually under Georgia law, a plaintiff cannot even seek punitive damages. It's not a factor. They cannot even seek punitive damages unless they send a demand for retraction and it is not taken down within seven days. So the original demand letter was not an offer of compromise. Nowhere in that letter did it say, if you take down the videos, we're good. There was no offer of compromise. It wasn't marked under rule 408. It basically said under Georgia law, we're giving you this notice that you need to take them down and she responded. And when your honor looked at these two communications last time, you ruled this isn't an offer of compromise. It's admissible, it's coming in. It touches a lot of different things, the allegations, etc. I like to point out a couple of other things. Also, there is no new evidence here. All of these communications that we're talking about, Ms. Azamalova saying there are more full versions of them are actually on our exhibit list. They had them. They've had them for years. They were produced in discovery in October of 2020, and they actually... Hold on a second. So we got to deal right here, right now, with the casual conversation that happened with defense counsel. Throughout this case, most of these discussions have been by Zoom. But when the opposing counsel is making statements, and sometimes when defense counsel is making statements, sir, you always want to chime in and you want to say things. That's not the way... That's not way the way it's going to work. There's a okay. note. I just want to tell everybody, this is where the judge is scolding her male attorney because he was whispering while the other one was talking. So the judge had to chastise him. Okay, go ahead. I had to tell that part. That's not the way, the way it's going to work. There's a notepad on your desk. And if you want to communicate to your co-counsel, you write out a note to her. But I'm not going to tolerate you speaking when I'm trying to listen to someone else speak. I understand there's a need to communicate, but writing is sufficient. And if when Ms. Matz is finished, if you're, you want to consult with Ms. Osmilova before she responds, fine. Just say, I need a chance to confer. But this casual conversation that goes on between the two of you is not professional in a court of law when there's proceedings because it interrupts those proceedings. So let's just nip that in the bud and let's not have that happen again, all right? Ooh, <laughs> Sylvia. Yes. Understood, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have it up. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I forgot where I was. Discovery. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. We produced all of this in this discovery, and I actually like to bring one other thing to the court's attention that actually didn't come up at the last hearing. It kind of did. At the last hearing, when they made their motion, the defense made their motion to preclude settlement communications. They did not attach or refer to any specific Bates numbers or exhibits. And at the last conference, when we were talking about this, I said to the court, I presume this is what they're talking about. And I made an assumption. And I apparently made a bad assumption because last night I went back and checked the exhibit list and their objections to it. They didn't actually even raise this objection to either of the exhibits that your honor is looking at. There was no settlement objection raised in the pretrial conference when all the objections were due. So from our perspective, in addition to there being nothing new to actually re-argue here because they had every opportunity, this was their motion to exclude. They should have known that exhibits, what exhibits they were talking about, they had all of them. We had every opportunity to make this argument before and they didn't. So, you know, there shouldn't be a re-argument when there's truly nothing new. And the standard for new evidence is that somebody did have it or with reasonable diligence, 
they couldn't have discovered it and they don't meet that standard. Also, just to make this point, the motion is also late under the local rules. The local rules of this court say the motions for reconsideration are supposed to be filed within 28 days. And I believe that the last pretrial, pretrial conference was made November the 7th or November the 8th. And I apologize, I don't remember the exact date, Your Honor, but you know, from that perspective, it's waived. But I think those are all reasons that you wouldn't even have to consider this motion to or entertain it. But at the end of the day, I don't think it actually qualifies as a settlement communication in the first place. The initial letter we sent was not a settlement offer and her response also wasn't one. So there's no question when the initial letter was sent that the plaintiff was considered litigation as a means of enforcement, but it also clear, but it's also clear that it wasn't a settlement offer. In fact, if you look at the response that came from the plaintiff's counsel to the defendant's counsel, excuse me, to the defendant in response to the communication, to me, the only proper way to interpret this is, okay, you withdraw or retract the statement that you made and stop doing that because you're continuing to do them as, as we speak. And we cannot talk about a settlement. I mean, that's the way I interpret it. And, you know, I'm not too hung up about the rules, the local rules, as it relates to timing, because the issue about timing and particularly about local rules, we're not, we're not as insulate me from being reversed by the Court of Appeals because our local rules are not their rules. And if they are their rules, if a judge of the Court of Appeals or the majority of the judges that hear this appeal decide that they think I was wrong about it, was a big deal that I was wrong. They may not care so much about whatever procedural impediment, impediment may have existed because they may think it's unfair. And I'm not criticizing the Court of Appeals. I mean, I just think that how you look at an issue sometimes when you, you are an appellate judge depends on how, depends on what you think it's fair overall. So in any event, the timing issue doesn't really bother me, but I think particularly if Georgia law does require not as a factor, but as a condition that a retraction demand has been sent. The fact that the plaintiff sent the demand, the fact that the defendant responded to the demand when there was no lawsuit pending or other terms discussed and made critical admission against interest, that's relevant and that's coming in. And the defendant should know that. The defendant should have known that when she made the statement that I don't care if these things are true or not. I mean, that goes to whether or not if we assume that they're that they are not true, whether or not the defendant, the plaintiff can pierce the malice prong of def defamation against a public figure, a semi public figure, which is clearly in play here, because I know the defendant is going to say that, well, it was reasonable for me to, to reply on what these people were telling me or what I was seeing on the Internet. But there's a responsibility that goes along with that. And that's a duty to investigate and determine whether or not there's a basis of basis or not. You just can't blindly say something that someone says just because. You can put this in the criminal context. In fact, it seems like everything can be put in the criminal context. But a judge who is issuing a warrant can't simply rely on the fact that the police or the FBI have confidential informants without knowing whether or not the confidential informant has some credibility to him. Is, that, is, is it someone that has assisted the government in the past, has proved successful in the statements that they've made? And if not, then there's, there's got to be some other independent indica that would show that what the person is saying is true, which is why when a confidential informant gives information about drug dealing, the police often sends in the confidential informant or someone else to buy to determine whether or not what they have done, have been told is true. And that establishes credibility. So the defendants are going to have to show that when they rely on, at least argu arguably so, that when they rely on statements made to them by people about what those people know about the plan, that there is some reason that they can trust those statements. One thing I think we all know is that, as that one jury was saying yesterday, the internet is full of falsity, sometimes truth, but you know, you've got to figure it out whether it's true or not. So the motion for reconsider reconsideration is denied. I think the letter sent by the plaintiff 
And the response sent by the defendant was, are admissible for issues that are critical to this case. All right, so I will just stick with the defendant since we started with the defendant. Is there any other issues we need to talk about before we start this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. I just want to address the fact that since that is coming in, even though we believe it was part of the settlement negotiation, I don't. I want to meet pre-trial and make sure that the plaintiff understands because they've made all these allegations yesterday about how we are going to introduce evidence that's violating the court's order. But Ms. Kibi allowed to put in evidence of state of mind or what was going on around the time that she wrote that email and explained. State of mind generally? I mean, I don't know. I mean, just because there's some anything that she might know about anything doesn't come in. It's still got to be relevant. So, Right. So it's hard to explain why she wrote that email, why she said what she said. She's able to introduce that evidence if they introduce evidence of that, of her statements in that email. Well, they're going to they're going to introduce evidence of that statement sure and so when she wrote the email she wants to introduce that she was relying on to say i don't know if this stuff is true or not no she wants to introduce evidence as to why she even chose to respond to her attorneys in the first place wow something you've got to give me i mean you're going to to seek to introduce something that's not been permitted pursuant to previous ruling. You've got to give me more than that. For example, like the fact that she was being harassed and stalked and, you know, had to, you know, move. And now we have actually evidence that the person who was doing all that was in direct communication, was hired by the plaintiff to do so. Um, hold on just say oh so she has no evidence period that anyone that may have been harassing her was associated with the plan no no the evidence that were that we do have for the one person i'm specifically speaking about dennis byron she i'm sorry uh, where was I? Oh, what Seven. line is that? I'm sorry. Seven. Seven. Okay. Uh, you've got to enunciate a little more clearly because you've got a mask on and it's harder to hear. I'm sorry. And you and I both have accents and there's not the same. So I know I need to do the same. I apologize. I'm not speaking about they, you know, random or like, you know, the Instagram users. I'm not speaking about the that evidence at all. I'm speaking specifically about there's evidence that we have that a person named Dennis Byron was going to defend its um states. I mean, okay. Different. <laughs> huh? Oh, going to different Different states. Okay. Taking out protective order against Miss Kibi trying to, you know get her arrested like wow. doing all thing these things right around this time then we also have evidence that he was hired by the plaintiff and on the same date they were communicating back and forth about him doing these things you're using pronouns they were communicating the plaintiff and mr byron that the plaintiff and dennis byron were communicating generally about your client he was retained by the plaintiff. Dennis Byron was retained by the plaintiff specifically to, quote, unquote, help with the investigation for the case. Okay. And so he will report to the plaintiff directly, directly things that, you know, like they would come up with plans or schemes or what, you know, what to do next to basically harass her. To intimidate Miss Kibi. Lies. 
that is okay. Twice. So the problem when you argue <laughs> is you inject a lot of speculations in your lawyer's argument into what mm -hmm. are the facts. You don't know what scheming in quotes and the plaintiff did with Dennis Bryan. Byron, that's just your characterization about the communication you know about. So let's just talk specifically about the communication you know about. So summarize for me those communications. They were via text message and we received, I don't know if your honor recalls, you had received an email, I mean, you have received an in camera, a lot of messages that your honor had reviewed. And from those, I did include several, not the whole production, but several depositions that I believe are the most relevant around the same date and time. Just kind of get to the point. What's of, what specifically are you talking about? And what was the date of those things in reference to this letter? So... Well, let's back up. None of these communications between the plaintiff and Byron. What's his name again? Dennis Byron. Dennis Byron was known to your client at this time, right? She did not know. Okay. All right. So those are out of the window right, right there because they couldn't have formed any basis of the reason she sent this letter. There, That's her trying to prove that there is some, some relationship. So what would you, what would she have known about the time she sent this letter? What she knew about was that Dennis Byron was doing things, doing things to her. Okay. Without going into more discussion about what Dennis Byron was doing, how did she know at that time that Dennis Byron was associated with the plaintiff? She didn't have any you know, solid proof of or evidence, but she figured that he was because the plaintiff is associated with a lot of people. She was in, she's in a gang. Oh she's a gang member. So what was the state of mind that my, I mean, so that was the state of mind that my client had at the time that she was receiving these communications from Mr. Byron. In addition to that, Dennis Byron did post made a Facebook post at this at some point in time way before before we found out about the text message that oh Cardi B called my daughter to say happy birthday so there was Cardi B called my daughter to say happy birthday right so you telling me that your client would testify that at the time she sent this letter that she had seen some kind of post about Dennis Byron had said Cardi B called to wish my. I'm not sure of the day of the post. Wow. What I'm saying is like there was a lot of different other people that was also harassing my Miss Kibi. As you remember, Judge, we've already. Oh my goodness, I can't read that. We already think, discussed it before. But it states stated at the end of 2018 and went through to about the middle of 2019. This email was sent in March of, of 2019. So it was in the midst of all of this those communications. So she will explain that while I sent this letter, where I, where I acknowledge I don't know what's true and what's not true, because I was generally being harassed by people that I thought were sympathetic to the plaintiff that were fans or otherwise. Um, so I was scared of the plaintiff. So, and so I sent this response. So that's one thing she, sh she would say. What else would she say? Your honor, not only she was scared enough to break her lease at one home to move to completely different address. So it wasn't just that. Oh, when did she break her lease? Uh -oh. She broke her lease at the end of 2018. She moved into her new home February 2019. <sighs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That's what she did. That's not what she knew. That's all I'm focused on. What she knew. She knew that she was 
had generally been harassed by people online that she felt was sympathetic to the plaintiff and that they might be controlled by the plaintiff. That's one thing she knew. And she doesn't know whether these people had any relationships with the plaintiff or not. But that's what she would say that she thought. And what else? What else? I'm sorry, Your Honor. May I have a second to prefer? Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. His name is Byron Nelson again. I'm sorry. Dennis Byron. Dennis Byron. <clears throat> and the reason I'm questioning that in my mind is that it sounds like a former pro golfer, Byron Nelson. All right. So she knew what was happening social media wise directed toward her. Yes, Your Honor. That's one thing she knew was happening to her. Whether or not she could say she who was doing it or not is highly questionable. And then what else? I mean, I guess obviously she made Pacific, you know, moves or Pacific. That's what your client did. <laughs> I'm not interested in what your client did. I'm interested in what she knew that would have formed an opinion in this letter. I'm so, sorry. So, yeah, hold up a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wow. sorry, y'all. The judge is not played. Thank you, dark and lovely. <laughs> wow. But then they said she didn't know at the time. She found out later that it was Dennis Byron doing it. Let's let this read. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> okay, go ahead, y'all. I'm sorry. Go Order ahead. in the court. That's what you're... That's what your client did. I'm not interested in what your client did. I'm interested in what she knew that would have formed the opinion in this letter. So she knew this general harassment was occurring to her by, by online people. Right. Right. Tanya. And then what else did she know? She knew that the plaintiff was a gang member. <laughs> <laughs> and Tanya. We lost the judge. So she from the yeah, need, where's Mel? I need a backup. Mel, come in, please. I need backups. <laughs> tell, tell, um Tasha, go ahead and read it while she, um Tanya's gone for a minute. So she oh. From the plaintiff's own admissions. She doesn't know that the plaintiff is a gang member. That's an issue that's in dispute. But she thought that the plaintiff was a gang member based on things that she had seen or heard. Your Honor, there was a there was a GQ article write up where the plaintiff gave direct quotes about being a gang member. So it wasn't like it was a that's probably coming in, I get. And so, but I mean, you can't say that it's fact. There's been no, wait a minute. Let's just say this. I do have the right to it, interrupt, but you don't. My apologies, your honor. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is in court. What she says she knew is often based on speculation and what she wants maybe it to be, but that doesn't make it fact. It doesn't mean it's not fact, but obviously if the plaintiff was a gang member or is a gang member and your client can prove that, that might prove some defense of some of the things that she said, but let's use it in the most basic form. She knew she had been harassed by people online that she associated to be with the plaintiff for whatever reason. She had read or seen or heard or thought that the plaintiff was in a gang. And what else? Correct. She knew that there was a person, some person who was posing as an investigator coming to try to, you know, interview her neighbors, which is one of the reasons why she moved. That person was Dennis Byron. Okay. She would testify that it was, how does she know that that person was doing that? 
the neighbor. One of the neighbors told her. Okay. And he was asking questions about her daughter, her family. Are you calling the neighbor to testify in this case? I guess not. No, your honor. <laughs> Why are you bringing this up? Wow. No <laughs> affidavit from the neighbor? Nothing. Just her saying so. And she's a liar. Wow. <laughs> okay. So it's hearsay as to whether or not somebody was actually investigating, but it's probably admissible not for the truth of the matter. Asserted, but to form a basis for what was in her mind. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And what else? <laughs> what she will be testifying generally is that, you know, she was, she herself was pregnant. So she was dealing with that at the time, at the same time. <sighs> that wouldn't have anything to do with whether the plaintiff was doing anything. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. That wouldn't have anything to do with whether the plaintiff was doing anything to her. But she would say, I was under a lot of stress because. A lot of stress. She had a high risk pregnancy. Worried about the pregnancy and how this was all going to affect that. Okay. What else? I mean, really, it was just, really, it was just these things. I just wanted to make sure because previously, specifically the plaintiffs, you know, potential gang affiliation would have been ruled out. So I just wanted to, you know, rebring that up because that is those were things that my client did consider whether true or or not like your honor said she had good reasons to believe these things and that explains her state of mind when she wrote the email and that's kind of what all i was trying to say to you was that those things should be admissible now too for her to explain her state of mind. Well, let me just say this. It's questionable whether she had a good faith reason to believe any of those things. And that's an issue that is obviously, obviously squarely in this lawsuit, because if she said things that aren't true, then you're going to be able to introduce evidence to demonstrate why she would believe those things. What the court has ruled previously is in granting the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment against the defendant's counterclaim was that your client had no admissible proof that could tie the things that she, the defendant, the I mean, complained about and said that the, I'm sorry, and said was the plaintiff's responsibility. Judge she could not tie it to the plaintiff. The judge is back. What we'll page you on? Uh, let me finish the sentence and then she could take it at number two on number page 29, number two. But let me finish the sentence. It was speculation. It was based on hearsay and supposition. So in any event, I understand your argument. You got it, Tanya? Anything else you want to say? Then I'll go back to Miss Matz and see what Mrs. Miss Matt has to say about it. Can I the say only... something? I, I just have a question. Okay, if she was so scared of Cardi B's gang affiliation, why does she keep on saying more things? Exactly. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I just. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing is there's only, I mean, there's also evidence we did submit, you know, evidence of what she believed the plaintiff's affiliation. I know that there's several tweets from the plaintiff herself admitting that she's in a gang as well. So those are all the types of, you know, information that my client relied on to make that conclusion that the plaintiff is a gang, is, is in a gang. What they got there? Ms. Matt. So, Your Honor, honestly, 
I'm really surprised right now. This feels like a very prejudicial backdoor attempt to re-argue basically the entirety of our motion in, in line, which your honor granted. You specifically ruled that all mention of gang-related activity was far too prejudicial because it's actually not in this case. None of the statements at issue relate to any type of violence or anything else about my client. We went through this at length at the pre-trial conference. Look, let me just start here. It would seem that if you want, um, and you do, if you want to get in the letter where she says, I don't know if these things are true and I'll withdraw them. If it would seem that they were made a credible, that they made a credible argument that, okay, maybe I did say those things. It wasn't really true. Um, I'm not talking about the allegations that plaintiff sued about, but maybe I did argue, agree that I didn't know if these things were true, but I was scared. And this is why I was scared. And this is why I would say what I said when what I said wasn't true in the letter itself. I mean, that you're asking me to prevent her from explaining why she said what she said. In my mind, it's inviting me to com commit reversible error because you're always a about to explain. And if that's her expl explanation, and honestly, I don't think it makes a lot of sense because there is no credible evidence to back up her claim. Wow. But if she says that's what I relied on, that's what she, I guess, relied on. And then the jury has to make a decision whether they believe it or not. I mean, you know, let's don't rely on rulings and things like that. Let's deal with the argument she's making. The argument she's making is that's why I said what I said. And how do I cut her off from her explanation? Sure. It's not a defense to defamation. It's simply not saying I sent something. You're relying on she she's admitted that she didn't know if they were true. OK, you're relying on that statement. Otherwise, how about this? You can just stop at your letter. If you just stop at your letter, you made a demand for retraction. You didn't get a retraction. I mean, I think everybody agrees that never happened. In fact, the defamation, according to the plaintiff, continues to this day. So you could stop at the letter and say, we demand a retraction. Jury, here it is. So now we can sue for punitive damages. But you want to go further. You want to get her admission, okay? You're entitled to it but she's also entitled to explain why she made the admission. The jury would have to decide whether they believe that or not. But it seems to me that if you wanna get that part in that, hey, here's the admission against interest, then she's entitled to explain it. I can't cut her off at the knees for explaining that. So I disagree with that for a couple of reasons, respectfully. One of which is that the prejudice of allowing some of this in if she wants to say Dennis Byron was coming around my house, maybe we could talk about the prejudice of that. But we haven't had that conversation because your honor did rule on this. And I just want to say that I think that those things should be considered to the extent we're considering re-reviewing your ruling because we did prepare in reliance upon it. However, my mention of any mention of gang activity and we talked about this at length about the Jernigan case. Any mention of gang activity in this case is so highly prejudicial and it is absolutely speculative. Hey, you're in control. You can draw trying to seek admission of that letter and there will be no mention of it. It would not be relevant then. So the plaintiff is in control. If you're willing not to admit the letter where she makes the admission, then there will be no mention of any of those things. Okay. I mean, honestly, I just want to put on the record that we are objecting. I don't think that being scared is a defense to make admissions. It's, it's an explanation. At the same time. So look, Ms. Matz, here's the bottom line. <laughs> 
is I'm not going to get reversed on this. If you want to admit this letter, then you're open the door for her to explain why she said what she said. If you don't admit that letter, you're only admitting your letter where you you're only admitting your letter where you demand a retraction and then you ask her, did she ever? I mean, the facts are gonna prove she never retracted it. Yes. Then you've proved your case as it relates to preventive damages. If you want to admit her letter, her email response where she makes certain admissions, then you cannot prevent her for explaining what was on in her mind. The stuff that happened after the letter, yeah, I agree that can't be a part of it. But the stuff that she knew, she could say that she was aware of at the time that form that, form, that basis of her opinion is going to be admissible for that. So the key is, it's your decision, not mine. I hear you. If you just permit me to put one more objection on the record, only to preserve it for appeal. Sure. And that is that I do feel that this is really prejudicial. This wasn't raised in any of their written papers. This was clearly their plan. I did say to your honor yesterday that they're clearly trying to get in all of this Dennis Byron evidence. They served written papers last night. They made absolutely no mention of this and then orally requested that you reconsider all of your rulings on the bench without giving us any opportunity to prepare written submissions or even know that this argument was coming. None of these arguments were made last time and Okay, so how much time do you need to consider the argument against this motion? I'm not sure it's going to change your honor's mind. I'm just putting it on the record that. Not that. <clears throat> I'm just saying, if you say you're not prepared, what would you have to prepare for? You would have to prepare to defend against things that can't be proven. So what is it? What is there to prepare for? To ask your client where when she testifies? And I presume she's going to testify either on direct or she's going to be called for a cross-examination by the defendant to say these things aren't true. I mean, in fact, we're not really even going to prove those things. She's able to testify what was in her mind. I mean, there's going to be evidence, I guess, that is really unconverted, unconverted about what your client may have said in the past. I mean... There's going to be some video at the very least where she's discussed some of these things. Some of these videos that were actually seen, that we've actually seen. I mean, you say it's it's not presidential, presidential just because it hurts your case. So it's got to be something more than that. Is there something else that you need to do to prepare for this trial and to deal with what the allegations about what she says is relied on when she made the statement that you want admissible? So I haven't had a chance to review any of the dates that they're talking about. And to the extent your honor is taking that into consideration, yes, I do think that we have been a bit prejudiced because we didn't know this argument was coming. I also think that to the extent that there is also a very clear analysis to be done here of the prejudice of specific gang related activity outweighing their probative value versus general harassment and saying I was scared and stressed, especially when the gang related activity is speculative. And this isn't something that this was all ruled out on the motion for summary judgment. And this is why we made the motion. Summary judgment doesn't limit evidence at trial. It just simply rules on claims. And yes, I said that there was no basis for them to be a counterclaim, to have a counterclaim. Your Honor, I understand that. But we moved to exclude all of the evidence related to their counterclaims at the last motion in Lyme hearing. And these were all specifically part of that, of what we ruled, of what we asked to exclude. And Your Honor agreed. As a separate motion in line, we move to exclude any mention of gang-related activity. And your honor agreed. And they said at the last hearing, this was not a defense. And we also had this conversation about the settlement email. This was not something that was ever raised as in its opening, the door on argument. 
And part of the issue is that we said we might still use some of the evidence related to the counterclaims to prove our defenses. This is not related to a defense that they have asserted in this case, and the entire purpose of forcing parties to plead every affirmative defense that they have and do this ahead of time is that so no one is surprised at trial. Well, there is no surprise to the plaintiff that this is what the plaintiff, that this is what the defendant has said. I mean, this isn't something new. Whether or not it would be admissible that you know, in all fairness to the plaintiff, perhaps a new thing. But the plaintiff says that these allegations aren't true. The defendant has no proof that they're true. The defendant says it was what she had read and heard, what was in her mind about how she was afraid. So that's why she said what she said. I can't see anything that the plaintiff could do to prepare to disapprove what was in the defendant's mind when she, when the plaintiff says these things aren't true. So I fail to see how there's been prejudice to the plaintiff other than you don't want it to be mentioned. Then I come back to the fact that it doesn't have to be mentioned if you don't admit her letter into response, which is not needed for you to set forth your claim of punitive damages and to qualify for the jury to decide to award them to you. It is only helpful to your claim because there are admissions in there that you want from the defendant about what she knew and didn't know about the allegations she had against the plaintiff. So I respect that the plaintiff wants to use that. I would want to use that if I was in the plaintiff's shoes, but it comes with certain warts. And this is one of the warts <clears throat> is that it gives and opens the door for the defendant to explain what was in her mind at the time. She doesn't have any proof that these things were in her mind are that were in her mind are in fact true, but it still goes. And she's still entitled to give an explanation. So I'm gonna let her do that. I'm not going to let her talk about things that post date the letter. I'm not gonna let her or her counsel argue that those things are true or proven just because she thought about them but she's going to be entitled to give an explanation for the statement. And the plaintiff is in control about whether she gets to give that explanation as to whether or not you admit the letter and I'll leave it up to you to decide. So let's move on to another issue. Ms. Izmalova, anything else from the defendant? If I could have, have one moment, your honor. No, your honor, I think that and I also need to remind everybody that federal rules are rules of inclusive inclusion, not exclusion. And it is relevant to her thinking at the time. All right. Anything else from the plaintiff about any other issues? I'm not going to talk about this anymore. The only other thing we just wanted to raise now is that at some point, when the trial starts, Mr. Kibi should be excluded from the courtroom. He is on our witness list. So let's talk about that. Is the plaintiff right about that? Your Honor. Oh, that's my turn. Your Honor, Mr. Kibi is one of the two named direct two shareholders of Kibi Studio LLC, which is the defendant in this case. Well, just because he's one of the two doesn't mean he gets to be in here. There's another way to argue it. Do you want to try that? <laughs> He's her husband. I don't know. He's her husband. I'm sorry. Her husband. Well, the husband, the husband thing doesn't work either. Husbands don't get to be in here, unfortunately. I don't know of any other. Who's your representative for the LLC? Mr. Keeby. He can be in here for that purpose. That's what I was assuming all along, that he was in here because he was a representative of the LLC. It doesn't have to be the same person. Yes, sir. As the individual, so he's going to be allowed to stay, all right? Anything else from the planet? No, Your Honor, except I would like a few minutes just to confer. This is a big change from our last meeting. Sure. How much, how long do you need? 
I think if you don't mind, if we could take a half an hour, I don't know what time if you were planning to break for lunch or what the break schedule is for today, but I. No, I'm not planning on breaking for lunch, but in light of you, you know, the decision I've made today, I'll give you a half an hour. If we'll just let the jury know, Ricky, that's where that we, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If we'll just let the jury know, Ricky, that's that we've got a little issue here that is going to take us 30 minutes to resolve and that, and they can stand at ease just to be back in the jury room by 1240. Yes, sir. Can I just ask for one other clarification on the record? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So your ruling about this opening the door only pertains to this email. We're not talking about her being allowed to open the door for other purposes that have not been articulated. And otherwise, your honor's ruling from the last conference stands. Well, I certainly couldn't extend my ruling to things that we haven't talked about. So this is all we've talked about. And so, yes, I'm agreeing with your statement that these issues about what's in her mind about gang membership, let's back up. It's part of the defamation statements that she may have made about gang affiliations. I don't remember that. No, absolutely not. One person at a time, please. No, absolutely not, Your Honor. Okay. And what else did you ask about? Gang membership and? So both the... About Byron Nelson, I guess... <laughs> and what he did and generally this theory that miss kibi was being stalked or harassed by my client which related to our motion in line to dismiss i can't see that any of that stuff is admissible for anything other than her explanation about why she sent the letter agreeing that things weren't true or she didn't know what they that they weren't true so would you mind asking the defense to make that representation? Because we have other statements she's made publicly in videos. And, you know, we're obviously going to talk about what we want to do in light of your honor's ruling. But, you know, I do feel that there is some, it is a little unfair if we can't rely on this and have some specifics about how broadly this is given that we're discussing it today. I mean, I don't think it's unfair or not. This is the only thing that's been presented to me. Is there any other reason that the things we're talk we've talked about, Byron Nelson and Dennis Byron, Your Honor? I'm sorry, Dennis. Br <laughs> Dennis Bryan. Byron Nelson is a PGA player. I'm sorry. It does. That's true. why. That's why it keeps coming up in my mind. Dennis Byron <clears throat> about Mr. Byron. I grew up near a town called Byron, Georgia, so I can remember Mr. Byron. All right, anything about Mr. Byron that would be related to anything else? No, it's only relevant to explain her state of mind. And of course, we would not bring it in. I mean, we would not bring it up if she doesn't, if she didn't need to explain. There's no defamation allegations related to any claims by the defendant that try to associate the plaintiff with gang membership, right? No, Your Honor. But now that I think about it, there is another, there is going to be another issue about opening the door. So I guess we should just probably address it now. I think on plaintiff's motion in Lyman, Lyman, Lemonade, Lemonade. Lemonade. Lemonade to exclude all evidence about plaintiff's husband's infidelity, Your Honor, had ruled on that. On that, there are several videos that are referencing uh, that reference in the amid complaint, which I'm presuming the plaintiff will present. You know, in evidence that are that basically only discuss the plaintiff's husband's infidelity, so. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're saying the plaintiff would seek to admit videos where the plaintiff discussed her husband's alleged? 
I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. The plaintiff filed a motion in uh, Lemony. Lemony, yeah. <laughs> and the court had decided to exclude any of my client's discussions of the plaintiff's husband infidelity, but there's a plaintiff suit based on the claims of infidelity that the defendant had said her husband had engaged in. No, but she did something, one of the alleged, you know, def def defamatory, <laughs> deflammatory statements is that my client said that the plaintiff was, you know, cheating on her husband, but Okay, and what was the evidence of that? I'm saying she said it was in a video. She being? My client. Said that the plaintiff may have? May have cheated at the time, at the same time that she was reporting about the plaintiff's husband cheating on the plaintiff. <laughs> All right, so what's your argument? So my only... I bring this up because there's a lot of exhibits on plaintiff's exhibit list that addresses um, other videos that my client had published that don't really think, I mean, talk about plaintiffs or anything like that, but they do talk about plaintiff's husband infidelity. And so if they bring these, if they introduce the, those videos, then that's going to open the door to the topic of plaintiff's husband's infidelity. And I just want to make sure that. I would assume the plaintiffs wouldn't admit documents or videos that say what they want to keep out. Me too, but they put them in on their exhibit list. So I just want to make sure they understand that that, that, that opens the door as well. Your Honor, if I can just refresh, I think I can cut to the chase if you don't mind. Okay. When we dealt with this issue, we dealt with it in a split manner. There were some videos where Miss Kibi, the defendant, says, and I am paraphrasing here, says something like that the plaintiff's husband was cheating, so she stepped out too, or she got herself a side piece or something like that. <laughs> we already agreed that to the extent she's talking about both of them, those are probably coming in because there's not a way to parse the statements. The motion we made was to preclude excessive evidence where these statements are only about the defendant's husband, husband, excuse me, about the plaintiff's husband. I apologize. I misspoke. So I don't really see how that changes anything. This shouldn't become a trial. My client did not assert defamation claims based on what the defendant said about her husband. Nor could she. Nor she couldn't. Nor could she. I'm not sure she could, but it's not at issue. So the point was to not allow unfairly prejudicial evidence about this to the extent it's not relevant to the claims. Agree. And that they put a whole bunch of videos on their witness list where my client only talks exclusively about the husband's infidelity. Okay. There's really nothing for me to rule on here. <laughs> I mean, we'll just wait and see what the plaintiff introduces. And if she does introduce videos that exclusively talk about her husband's, um, the allegations against her husband for allegedly having an affair, two double alleges here. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what the defendant even knows about it. I mean, probably nothing unless the defendant knows the plaintiff, but it's just not relevant to the plaintiffs. There's no way that one person can sue another person for what that other person said about someone who's not a party to this lawsuit. There's no standing. If we think about it in the typical standpoint, even though it would be very help hurtful, obviously, if the allegations were true, normally, I would think, most people would think. So I just don't think there's anything for me to rule on right now. Yeah. So we kind of diverged a little bit. I would just like to go back to what I asked. And that is that because the things I was mainly concerned with, concern was with the Dennis Byrne, 
which your honor did ask. And Miss Azimilova said, there's nothing else that we're planning or making that argument for. The general stalking and harassing claims and then the gang membership. Those were the three things. I just like to make sure that there's a representation here that they're not trying to re-argue those in some other manner. So general stalking claims, would that be, um, well, how would that be relevant to anything if this letter is not in? I don't think it is. I just like. I'm speaking to Ms. Ismalova. Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I'm not looking at her. Your Honor, I can't imagine how it would be. And I would just say that if some evidence comes out during plaintiff's case in chief that reopens the door to this evidence, that would be the only time that. Okay. So here's the ruling I can give you. If somebody opens the door to something, the door gets open. I mean, that's just law. That's just procedural law. But I can't rule when that might happen. You'll just have to let me know that if there's something that has been prohibited and you believe the door has been open before you try to introduce that evidence, then we've got to have a discussion outside the presence of the jury about why you think the door has been open. You cannot mention it to the jury um, either directly as an attorney or by question to any witness until we've talked about it at a sidebar or at the presence of the jury, okay? We're good. Anything else, Ms. Max, then? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so we'll take a break for 30 minutes. Thank you. All right. Powerful. All rise. This court is in recess for 30 minutes. Uh, yeah. Do y'all want to take a break, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Wow. Let's take some questions from the um the the uh chat. Anybody in the chat have any questions? Well, what do y'all think so far? What do you think? <laughs> Chat our panel because I think the judge is really frustrated. <laughs> I, just, okay. I just don't understand how Tasha talked about she in the game, but she studied talking to this lady, bothering her. Well, guys, well, when we come back, they're going to start the actual, um, uh, what do you call it, examination, you know, testimony of Tasha K. So, you guys are ready? So who's cheating? <laughs> Job nine, where have you been? Where you have been, Job, Job 49? I haven't seen you in a while, young lady. Well, anyway, let's get going. We got 123 people in the chat. How many likes do we have, guys? How many likes? Come on, winos. Y'all know y'all could hit the like button because I'm reading the transcript for y'all because y'all know y'all want to hear it. Y'all want to hear where you get your girl stand. <laughs> So, Sylvia, are we skipping down to where no, it no, starts? You get, no. Oh, you got, okay. You got you tired of reading that part? It's almost I'm start. not reading at all. I was just asking because you said when we come back. So, are we coming back from break reading the no, part? No, we're, or doing we... we're doing it now. We're doing it now. Okay. I just thought maybe it was coming up soon because they, they took a break. Took 30 minutes, right? Oh, no. We still have another 40. I just thought maybe it was coming up uh, you gotta turn your thing down in the back, Miss um, Court Reporter, Miss Court Lady. You got stuff, something playing in your background. All right, y'all guys, you ready? Hit the like buttons. Hit the like button. Mel, where you? Where you been? We've been looking for you earlier because you were supposed to play that lady, that Olga. <laughs> um. All right, you guys, you ready? Yep. All right. Let's go. All right. Is plaintiff ready to proceed? All right. All right. The court All right. again in session. Oh, ma'am, you got some complaining about the court in session. Ma'am, you can see plaintiff in session. Wait, we got to mute her. Ma'am, you can see plaintiff in session. 
Okay, I got to mute her. Sorry, guys. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, Your Honor, All we right. are. Okay. All right. So let's let me just clarify for the record my thinking about the admissibility should the plaintiff seek to admit the defendant's response to the demand for retraction. The court finds that it's admissible, that it was not an offer to compromise, that its admissibility, though, is based on the admission that the defendants make in the letter that would aid the plaintiff's proof at the very least of the malice element and the recklessness of the decision of the defendant to make the statement that she made. And we'll just wait and see if the plaintiff seeks to introduce it or not. But the court would intend to admit it should the plaintiff offer it in evidence. All right, call the jury, please. What is going on? Yes, sir. Your Honor? Yes, Ma sir. <laughs> what is she doing? <laughs> <laughs> <Get> tired. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Go ahead. Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Can I bring up one thing before the jury comes in? Yes. I apologize. So those of you that are sitting on the right side of the courtroom, I'm going to ask you to relocate to the left side of the courtroom. If any jurors want to sit in that area, it's going to be reserved for them, for the jurors. I'm sorry. Is there something else you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I was just going to ask. I'm prepared to proceed with opening arguments. I was wondering if, however, we could start with testimony tomorrow morning because it does impact a few things in our case that we had based around the last rulings and no we're starting now you you can just have to lawyers have to make adjustments on the fly so i gave you a continuance of 30 minutes before opening i've got to be respectful of understood your honor okay thank you respectful of jury's time yes sir all right so all right <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. My deputy's sleeping over there somewhere. <laughs> Go ahead, y'all. Sorry. So, as y'all come in and have a seat, I'm going to ask you to try to leave some space, kind of stagger your seating. And let me also say does anyone want to sit in the pew as opposed to sitting in our chairs? We've got 14 chairs, and there's 10 of you. So if you want some space, then you can have it. And you can have the whole left side of the courtroom over there if you'd like. Don't be shy. If anybody wants to go have a seat in the pews, feel free to do that. Does anybody want to go have a seat in the gallery? If you ever change your mind, just let me know, and I'll be glad to accommodate your, you sitting there. There are video monitors in front of you in the jury box but there's also a monitor that points toward the gallery area as well when documents and things like that are introduced. So I want to make sure everybody feels comfortable as best as we can for the space limitations that we have. So let me just start off by saying that I'm in a great mood today. <laughs> have a good, had a good night from, for my football team, a little tired, I suppose, but it was well worth it to have had experience, the experience last night. I appreciate y'all indulging us by starting a little bit late today. I know for a fact I'm not the only person in the courtroom that watched the game. Hopefully some of you are interested and you had a chance to do that as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to administer an oath to you as juries that have been selected to try this case. Give me a second, please. I'm gonna ask if you would all raise your right hand please. And at the end of the oath, I'll ask you to say, I agree. All right. You can put your hands down. Does anybody accept from, does anybody ex accept from the oath? The court sees none. All juries have been sworn. Members of the jury, now that you've been sworn in, I want to explain some basic principles to you about civil trials and your duties as jurors. They these are prim uh, preliminary instructions. I'm going to give you more detailed instructions at the end of the, tr of the trial. 
it's your duty to listen to the evidence, to decide what happens, and to apply the law to the facts. It's my job as the judge to provide you with the law, which you must apply and you must follow even if you disagree with the law. You must decide the case on only the evidence that is presented in the courtroom. Evidence comes in many forms. It can be testimony about what someone saw or heard. It can be an exhibit or a photograph. It can be someone's opinion. Some evidence may prove a fact indirectly. For example, let's just say a witness saw wet grass outside and people walking in the courtroom carrying wet umbrellas. This may be indirect evidence that it's rained, that it rained, even though the witness didn't personally see it rain. Indirect evidence like this is also called circumstantial evidence. It's simply a chain of circumstances that likely prove a fact. As far as the law is concerned, it makes no difference whether evidence is direct or indirect. You may choose to believe or disbelieve either. Your job is to give each piece of evidence whether I'm sorry. Your job is to give each piece of evidence whatever weight you think it deserves. During the trial, you're going to hear certain things that are not evidence. You must not consider them. First, the lawyer's statements and their arguments are not evidence. In their opening statements that you'll hear in a few moments and closing arguments at the end of the trial, the lawyers will discuss the case with you. Their remarks may help you follow each other's each side's argument and pr presentation of the evidence, but the remarks themselves are not evidence and should not play a role in your deliberations. Second, the lawyer's questions and the objections to those questions are not evidence. Only the witness's answers are, wit are evidence. Don't decide that something is true just because a lawyer's question suggests that it is. For example, a lawyer may ask a witness, you saw Mr. Jones hit his sister, didn't you? The question is not evidence of what the witness saw or what Mr. Jones did unless the witness agrees with the question. There are rules of evidence that control what the court can receive into evidence. When a lawyer asks a question or presents an exhibit, the opposing lawyer may object if he or she thinks the rules of evidence doesn't, don't permit it. If I overrule the objection, then the witness may answer that question or the court may receive the exhibit. If I sustain the objection, then the witness cannot answer that question and the court cannot receive the exhibit. When I sustain an, a, an objection to a question, you must ignore the question and not guess what the answer might have been. Sometimes I may disallow evidence. That is, I might strike evidence that is coming in and order you to disregard or to ignore it. That means that you cannot consider that evidence when you're deciding the case. I may allow some evidence only for a limited purpose. When I instruct you that I've admitted an item of evidence for a limited purpose, you must consider it only for that purpose and for no other. To reach a verdict, you may have to decide whether testimony. Well, let's, let's, let me start over. To reach a verdict, you may decide you may have to decide which testimony to believe and which testimony not to believe if there is some that you don't believe. You, as the jury, may believe everything a witness says, part of what that witness says, or none of it. When considering a witness testimony, you may take into account the witness's opportunity and ability to see, hear, and know the things about which that witness testifies. The witness's memory, the witness's manner while testifying, any interest the witness has in the outcome of the case, any bias or prejudice that the witness may have, any other evidence that contradicts the witness testimony, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony in light of all the other evidence, and any other fact which you believe affected believability. At the end of the trial, I will reiterate these guidelines for determining a witness credibility. The case before you today is a civil case brought by the plaintiff against the defendant in which the plaintiff claims that based on videos that the defendant posted on YouTube about the plaintiff, that the defendants are liable for defamation 
invasion of privacy, false light, and intentional infliction of mental emotional distress. The plaintiff has the burden of proof proving her case by what is called preponderance of the evidence. That means that the plaintiff must prove that in light of all the evidence which she claims is more likely true than not. So if you could put the evidence favoring the plaintiff and the defendant on opposite sides of the balancing scale, the plaintiff needs to make the scales tip to her side. If the plaintiff fails to meet that this burden as to any particular claim, then as to that claim, you must find in favor of the defendant. To decide whether any claim has been proved by preponderance of evidence, you may, unless I instruct you otherwise, consider all the testimony of the witnesses, regardless of who called them and all the exhibits that the court has allowed, regardless of who introduces it. After considering all the evidence, if you decide that a claim or a fact is more likely true than not, then the claims or fact has been proved by a preponderance of the evidence. While serving on a jury, you may not talk with anyone about anything related to this case. You should tell people that you're a jury and give them information about when you must be in court, but you must not discuss anything about the case itself with anyone. And this includes with each other. You shouldn't talk about the case with each other until you begin your jury deliberations after the closing arguments and after the court gives you the law that applies to the case. You want to make sure that you've heard everything, all the evidence, the lawyer's closing arguments, and my instructions on the law before you begin to deliberate. You should keep an open mind until the end of the trial. Premature discussions may lead to premature decisions. So it's a different world than it was 30 years ago. People might not talk, but they often use social media and other technologies to communicate. So I want to emphasize that in addition to not talking face to face with anyone, you must also not communicate with anyone by any means, any other means, not emails, not text messages, not the internet, including any social media platforms. You should not Google or search online or offline for any information about this case, about the parties or about the law. Do not read or listen to the news about this case or visit any places related to this case that might be described by the evidence. Do not research any fact, law, or issues related to this case. The law forbids juries to talk with anyone else about the case and forbids anyone else to talk to the juries about it. As I stated yesterday before we ended our session that it's well, you must base your decision only on what happens in the courtroom. There are certain rules about what we can receive and what can't come into court. The parties are entitled to know what is presented and what you might consider. And so, and so you should limit it only to what comes in in the courtroom pursuant to the rules. The law often uses words and phases in special ways. Legal words have legal meaning sometimes different from the general meaning. And it's important that any definition you hear about what these words mean come from me and not from any other source. Only you, the juries, can decide a verdict in this case. The law sees only you as fair, and only you have promised to be fair. No one else is so qualified. So if you want to take notes, then this is going to be a long trial. And that probably will help be helpful to at least some of you. Please don't share your notes with each other during the course of the trial until the jury deliberations. If you see fit, it's time to do so. I would ask that you put your name on the first page of your notepad and have your notes taken to be taken be on the subsequent pages. <clears throat> that way, at the end of the day, you can leave your notes in the jury deliberation room and they can be disseminated the next day without anyone having to look at what your notes may have said. Now, don't let your note taking though distract you from carefully listening to what is said in court, observing the witnesses in their manner of testifying. Whether or not you you take notes, whether or not you take notes should 
rely on your own memory of the testimony. Your notes are there only to help your memory. The notes are not entitled to greater weight than your memory or impression about what about the testimony. Whether you take notes or not, please pay careful attention to the witnesses and their testimony because after the trial, while you're deliberating, I will not be able to provide you with a transcript of what has been said. The lady in front of you is the court reporter that works in this courtroom. She is creating a transcript, but her version of things won't be final until after the trial is over with because she'll have to go back and she'll listen to the testimony and she'll proofread stuff that she does on a daily basis. You know, we all make mistakes and some of the processes of creating transcripts usually artificial uses artificial intelligence. And you know, it doesn't often do it correctly and you have to go back and make it correct. And so the bottom line is while I might be able to read along some read along some with what is going on in the courtroom and on a unofficial translation that's not complete. It's not final until way after trial. So the bottom line is you can, can't can miss something that occurs and then think, well, I can read about it later because you're not gonna be able to read it until afterwards. The records that's created here is for purposes of on appeal that later and not for purposes of the jury's consideration during the trial itself. So let me talk a little bit about the trial process. First, the plaintiff and the defendants will have the opportunity to make an opening statement. They don't have to, but I expect they will. I want you to, to remember what I said. The lawyers making an opening statement is not evident. It's not supposed to be argumentative. It's just an outline of what that party believes they can prove or what the evidence will show during the course of the trial. After opening arguments, the plaintiff will then present her witnesses and ask them questions. After the plaintiff asks questions of her witnesses, the defendant counsel may also ask witnesses those witnesses questions. That's called cross-examination, cross-examining the witnesses. Once the plaintiff has introduced all of her evidence, testimony of witnesses, any documents or exhibits that may be introduced through those witnesses, it will then be the defendant's opportunity to present their witnesses. Any witnesses called by the defendant can also be questioned by the plaintiff's counsel, cross-examined, as the defendant also has that right related to the plaintiff's witnesses. I want to base your decision in this case on all of the evidence, regardless of what parties presented it. After all of the evidence has been introduced, the parties will present closing arguments to you in which they will summarize and interpret for you the evidence that you have heard. I will then give you the law, jury instructions, and then you will go out and begin your deliberations. That is the first time that you should begin talking about the case. I think jurors often wonder why they don't give you the law now. And the reason we don't do that is twofold. One is I'm not going to know all of the law that might be applicable to this case until all the evidence is presented. The law has to be adjusted to the evidence. Certain things, certain parts of the law that could apply may not apply depending on what the evidence ends up being. So I have to wait until the end to make the decision. And the second reason is probably the most important reason is I don't want you to concern yourself with the law at this point in time. I want you to concern yourself with determining based upon what you see and hear and read and what about what happened. And then at the end, once you've had all that evidence, I'll give you the law and you can discuss what you've decided happened and apply it to the law to determine what the verdict is in this case should be. Sometimes wow. party sometimes parties agree that certain facts are true. Their argument is called stipulation. If any stipulations are presented to you, then you must treat those these stipulations as facts that have been proved for purposes of this case. Now, a disposition is a witness's sworn testimony that is taken before trial. During the disposition, the witness is under oath and he or she swears to tell the truth. And the lawyers for each party can ask questions of the witness. A court reporter is present and records re and records the questions that are asked and the answers that the witnesses give. Disposition testimony is entitled to the same consideration by you as live testimony. 
and you must judge it in the same way as if the witnesses were here testifying in court. In considering a disposition testimony, do not place any significance on the behavior or the tone of the voice of the person who may be reading those questions and the answers that the witnesses gave. From time to time, it's gonna be necessary, I'm, I'm sure, for me and the lawyers to have discussions outside your ability to hear. Typically, we'll go over here in the right side of the bench. There's a microphone over there. So we'll talk loud enough that the court reporter can hear us, but hopefully not loud enough for you to hear us. And the reason we have these bench conferences is that we've, we're, take, we're trying to make sure that we're all following the correct rules of evidence that apply before something is said or done that is the right decision. If those discussions become lengthy or involved more than what we can just do while we whisper on the side of the bench, then I might have to send you outside the courtroom so that we can discuss the matters in a little bit more open environment. We'll do our best to keep those to a minimum, but I just want you to be want to alert you to the fact that 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 will likely happen at some point during the course of the trial. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here. We are now ready to have opening statements. The plaintiff is, in this case has the burden of proof, and so they have an opportunity to make their opening argument statements first for the plaintiff. And just make sure that counsel knows you both have thirty minutes. The plaintiff's time will be on the clock to the left behind the jury and the defendant's time would be on the right. I will not give you a warning when your time is about to expire, but when it's up, I'll tell you that you need to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the jury. My name is Sarah Matz. I represent the plaintiff, Belkulis Amanzar, who is professionally known as Cardi B. Many of you have likely heard of her before. She's a very talented rap artist. And you heard some things in this case yesterday, but today, as the judge said, you're going to start to hear the actual evidence. The judge is going to instruct you on the law. And based upon what you heard yesterday, you might think you know a little bit about this case. But today, we're actually going to start hearing about it. You're here to decide three basic claims. Our client has brought claims for defamation, invasion of privacy, and putting someone in a false light and intentional infliction of emotional distress. But make no mistake, the evidence is going to show that you're actually here because of the defendants and their behavior. This is not a case where the defendants merely said things that weren't true. They weren't that that weren't harmful or criticized my client or her music. That's not what the case is about. The evidence is going to show you that this case is about the defendants making repeated and relentless statements that are both vile and false about my client to torture her out of greed and spite. I apologize in advance. You're going to hear some curse words today and probably many days in this trial. I will assure you these are not necessarily my words, but these are the words I'm going to describe in some of the evidence you're going to hear today. So I'm going to use some of the words that you will hear later in evidence. The evidence is going to show that the defendants, Ms. Kibi and her company, Kibi Studios, which is under her control, published despicable falsehoods about my client in videos and written posts that were put on social media for the world to see. The evidence is going to show that they contain statements that my client engaged in disgusting and debasing acts with a beer bottle. The evidence is going to show you that one of the statements that was made in is that my client allegedly, while naked on a stage, took a beer bottle from a Patreon patron, put it in her vagina, took it out, drank a sip out of it, and handed it back to the patron. The evidence is also going to show that the defendants took to social media and published videos and posts saying that my client has herpes and HPV. The evidence is also going to show the defendants published videos on the internet that contain statements that my client committed adultery, cheated on her husband, that she engaged in prostitution and used cocaine. 
the evidence is also going to show you that none of this is true and that the defendants knew these statements were false or had a reckless disregard for whether or not they were true prior to publishing them repeatedly. This is not an isolated incident. The evidence is going to show that for years, the defendant has continued to make these statements and republish them and have taken pleasure in doing that to my client. Some of the evidence you're going to see is that defendants would, in their tweets and Instagrams, would call my client hashtag herpes B as a play on her professional name, Cardi B, or they would tag her for actually using handles on those social media applications to ensure both that they could use that as clickbait to drive viewers and add revenue to their platform and to ensure that everyone knew, including my client, that those were directed at her so that she could see the lies they were spreading about her. You're also going to hear evidence that all of the defendant's statements are probably false. We're going to see medical records that show that my client does not have herpes and does not have HPV. And you're going to hear that in testimony as well. You're going to hear that the defendant did not have any reliable information or proof that my client had those sexually transmitted infections before she went online and said it or published videos saying it. You're also going to hear the defendant admit that her source of the statement that my client had herpes was completely unreliable, that Ms. Kibi herself actually thought that the person was lying, that that source had told Ms. Kibi that she had a criminal past and that Ms. Kibi believed that the source had mental issues prior to publishing the statements, but Ms. Kibi published them anyway. You're also going to hear Ms. Kibi admit that she didn't obtain any corroborating documentation from this alleged source, and also that prior to the time she published the statements about my client having herpes, that she knew there were documents out there that another person she knew who helped her get this interview would debunk her source. She knew that before she published the statements, and the evidence will show you that she published them anyway. With reference to Ms. Kibi's statements that my client has HPV, we're going to hear evidence that shows that when she told the world and millions of people that my client has HPV, that she thought the story was false, but she put it out anyway. You're also going to hear that my client has never engaged in a debasing act with a beer bottle or a sexual act with a beer bottle the way Miss Kibi described or in any manner. You're going to hear evidence that my client has not only never done that, but that the source that Miss Kibi is going to try to rely on, a video online, doesn't resemble my client at all and that no reasonable person could have looked at that video and thought it was my client without a complete and utter reckless disregard for the truth. You're also going to hear that despite the fact that Miss Kibi follows my client on social media and the fact that she's aware that my client often goes on social media to talk about allegations being made about her, that she didn't bother to look at my client's social media, even though she knew that my client may, might have made statements saying that that wasn't her in the beer bottle video, which actually my client had made statements publicly, both on Twitter, and that was picked up in many news articles showing that it was not her in the video. But again, the evidence is going to show you that Ms. Kiwi stuck her head in the sand and decided to proceed anyway, despite the fact that there was no reasonable basis for her to do so. We're also going to hear evidence that my client never engaged in adultery. She's never engaged in prostitution and she has never done cocaine. Despite all of this, and you're going to hear evidence that the various time frames defendants had knowledge and the fact that at each step they had more and more and more knowledge. They have continued to make these statements many times, even while this lawsuit was pending after it was filed. The evidence is going to show you 
the defendants are never going to stop unless you stop them. You're going to see evidence that my client sent not one, not two, but three separate cease and desist and demands for retraction prior to filing a lawsuit. That didn't stop the defendants. You're going to see that after defendants received the first one, Ms. Kibi went online and told the world she was going to wipe her ass with it. You're going to hear evidence that even after this lawsuit, Ms. Kibi still refused to take the statements down. You're also going to hear evidence that directly prior to this lawsuit being filed, Ms. Kibi was sent another demand for retraction that went unheeded. And again, she went online and told viewers that she would wipe her ass with it. The evidence is going to show that even after this lawsuit was filed, even after my client took the step of starting this lawsuit to stop the campaign of defamation, the defendants continued to publish videos reiterating many of these statements. You're also going to hear evidence that during this lawsuit, another demand for retraction was sent regarding some of the new videos that the defendant didn't even bother to read it. Instead, she told her attorneys to tell us to F off. Members of the jury, the evidence will show you that we're here today because the defendants have just kept going. They refuse to stop. And they've said that they are never going to stop or take the videos down unless a court makes them. And that's why we're here today. The defendants have no incentive to take them down. They're making money using my client as clickbait and these defamatory statements as salacious ways to draw consumers in. And Ms. Kibi, you're going to hear her that she freely admitted that she knows this upsets my client. And she does it intentionally. Now the defense uh, is going to try to convince you that the Unwind Tasha K platform is opinion. You heard that word a lot yesterday. Or that the defendants had some belief that the statements that they were making were true or even more disgustedly that this is some kind of humor. But you're all smart people and the evidence that we're going to put before you is going to clearly show that none of that is the case. The defamatory statements are not opinion. The evidence is going to show that these are statements of fact that are capable of being proven true or false. And as I said a moment ago, you're going to hear evidence that they are demonstrably false. You're going to hear evidence also that that is exactly how Ms. Kibi presented them to the viewers of her platform. She presented them as facts. She told people everything I said was accurate. She has also referred to herself as a journalist to her viewers and has admitted that she has, although admits that she does not actually consider herself a journalist. Sylvia. Your yeah. Honor, I'm going to object. Yes. This is an argument. Oh, I'm, I'm the guy. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is argument. Argument. Tanya. Tanya stepped away for a minute. Okay. I'm sorry, it's what? <laughs> Argument. Objection. Objection is overruled. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. You're going to hear that by doing that, she's misleading her own viewers. The what evidence is argument. I know it. This is <laughs> this is <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm sorry. What is wrong with them? Argument. He said, What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Overruled, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. The evidence is also going to show that based upon the circumstances surrounding all of these and even some of the defendants' 
own statements in later videos that the defendants knew that some of these statements were false at the time they published them. And as to the others, that they clearly engage in a reckless disregard for the truth because they knew that the sources, the sources of the alleged information weren't credible and they had doubts about the veracity of those statements. The evidence is also going to show that this isn't funny. Saying people have highly stigmatic diseases and have engaged in disgusting and vile sexual acts with objects is not a joke. You're even going to hear Miss Keeby admit that she knows the statements like this, if false, are defamatory, and if someone said them about her, she would sue them. The evidence is going to show at the end of this that Miss Keeby's conduct and her company is so extreme it goes beyond all possible bounds of decency and it's atrocious and shouldn't be tolerated in a civil society. We're also going to see evidence that the defendants have intentionally done what they can to hurt and injure my client and that unfortunately and that unfortunately that succeeded. It kind of has hurt my client. You're going to hear evidence that who my client is. She's both a worldwide famous performer. She's also a young mother. And at the end of the day, this conduct has hurt her. And she suffered a tremendous amount of emotional pain from the statements and the impact that they've had on her. Now, most of you might have come in here thinking that my client isn't exactly like every single person in this room, and maybe she's not. She is an incredibly talented rap artist, an incredibly talented performer, and she's a woman, and she's a mother, and she's many things. But at the end of the day, she's also a human being. You're going to see evidence that she's come from humble beginnings. And although she's achieved a high level of success, this shouldn't be the price. Is it okay for defendants to go on the internet in front of millions of people and say that my client has herpes and HPV? Is it okay for the defendants to say that my client engaged in sexual acts with a beer bottle? Is it okay for the defendants to say that my client engaged in adultery or prostitution or cocaine when the evidence is going to show you that those things aren't true? Of course not. Becoming successful and famous doesn't give anyone the right to spread malicious falsehoods. Members of the jury, the judge is going to instruct you on the law. And after you've seen the facts here, we respectfully submit that there's only going to be one conclusion, and that is that the defendants are liable for the conduct that they've alleged. We greatly appreciate your time and your patience during this process. Thank you. All right. For the defendant. Sylvia. I know, I was trying to unmute myself. I had to go from the other side. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> All right. Miss Keeby's favorite childhood memories. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. Where's the violin? Hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Miss Keeby's favorite childhood memories was the time she spent. Wait a minute, let me finish reading, y'all. Can you stop? <laughs> you see what they're doing, y'all? Can I please read? Okay. Miss Keeby's favorite childhood memories memory was the time she spent with her mother, her uncles brothers and home watching celebrity news and making fun of the people they saw. This led her to an interest in radio broadcasts, which she began part-time while she was working at the Cheesecake Factory. She worked for many people, known Clark Howard, who is a close mentor of hers. And as she's tried to break into the radio and found it very difficult, YouTube was her new avenue. A new platform, 
a new opportunity for creative people who want to get themselves out there to do it themselves. Now, Mr. Kibi has his own interests. He was a video production. No, that was video production, video editing, and this is something he always done. Music videos, films, commercial, advertisement. And it just so happened while Miss Kibi was trying to bring herself up as a radio personality, Mr. Kibi was trying to bring himself up as a video editor. They met in 2000. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm sorry. Okay, they met in 2004 at Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, at Cheesecake Factory in Maryland, Mr. Kibi asked Miss Kibi, <laughs> "What the heck?" Wait a minute. Mr. Kibi asked Miss Kibi out on a date two weeks after they start, she started. Okay. Serious. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Wait a minute, y'all. It sounds like a soap opera. Not a trial. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Let me go back. Let me get serious. Mr. Kibi asked Miss Kibi out on a date two weeks after she started. They got married in 2006 and 2010 moved to Atlanta. In 2015, Mr. Kibi was at work and Miss Kibi was at home enjoying a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> and she saw a news article, oh my God. a clip, some gossip news about Lil Wayne. <laughs> What the heck? Little, little Wayne in I'm telling you how he did it in court. I'm this is how he did it. I'm telling y'all. This is how he did it. He, I can have a picture of him standing in front of the glass. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. What does this have to do with this trial? Could you li please listen? Let me take. Let me let you indulge in this for a minute, ma'am. Some gossip news about Little Wayne, who is a rapper, and his girlfriend breaking up. It was probably the wine. But Miss Kibi decided, decided. Oh, hold up! This this can't be real. No, I'm serious. This happened in court. This happened in court. Can I finish, please? So she blaming on the alcohol. Look, Johnny said a whole bottle. Y'all sounding biased right now. You better read. I'm reading the way the man said. I'm not being biased. I'm just saying that's them. That's not me. I'm trying to read. The I was in the courtroom. I heard the way the man was reading it. Okay. <laughs> Let me finish. It probably was the wine, but Miss Kibi decided to make a video about it. Just as general thoughts, well, she made the video, posted on Facebook, went to sleep. A few hours later, her husband runs into the house. What did you do, Tasha? My family can see all those videos. Or well, this video. Why did you post this? What are you talking about? Say, it has 5 million views. It went viral instantly. What? And at the moment, Miss Kibi and Mr. Kibi found their path in life. That was, <laughs> can I finish? Stop it. Okay, that was funny. <laughs> That's when Unwind with Tasha K the cha YouTube channel that that's an issue issue today begin. Now, I don't know what that means, but that's an issue today begin. Now, as I said, this project started in 2015 and with all good things, they came a time to build. And if you want to build something with solid foundation, that is one brick at a time. I don't know what the hell this man is talking about. <laughs> And so Ms. Kibi and Mr. Kibi have been Kebby, I'm sorry, Mr. Kebby and Miss Miss Kebby and Mr. Kebby have been building their dream one brick at a time. 
Now, in 2018, that was a particular good year for Unwind with Tasha K. She had broken many stories, particularly, here y'all, the story about R. Kelly. Mm. Just before the story, that's where at we're here to listen today. So Mr. Miss Kiwi at the point had already garnered such media attention. Her subscribers list had grown and the momentum was going forward. And that that in that about beginning in the middle of September 2018, what you're going to hear is what an individual named Star Marie Jones posted a video and was on a live chat with her followers and at the at the topic of plaintiff miss al nazar came up and during that video she made some allegation she alleged that you're here she alleged and you're here with the plaintiff and star marie they live together. They worked at the same strip club in New York, okay? And from that knowledge, her living with Miss Almazar, them working together, she made a few statements about Miss Almazar, Almazar. And that those statement Miss Kebby saw and those statement went viral. Those statements include things about, like I said, living with the plaintiff, her brushing, no, her brush in time with prostitution, her drug use, and certain other things. You know, here we'll hear the, that video. That video went viral. You'll hear that it was not Miss Jones' intent for that video to go viral or to publish a video about the plaintiff. It happened to come up during an unrelated live event. Regardless, it does it goes viral. And as all good journalists or reporter do, they want to get the scoop. They want to get the story. And the reason why we are here today is because Miss Kebby got that story. And so Miss Kebby, a few days after the IG Live was released, arranged a story or an interview with Miss Joan, which we will get to see. It's about 45 minutes to an hour where it will detail Miss Jones' relationship with the plaintiff, their time together in New York. You'll see how it described Miss Jones' version of it, and you will hear Miss Kebby cross-examining her as though she was an attorney to get the truth. Well, oh my God. <laughs> well, also, here's how the plaintiff contacted Miss Kebby. And you'll hear how Miss Kebby offered her an opportunity to discuss the video. Plaintiff declined. Plaintiff suggested that Miss Kebby should talk to her other friends, friends that worked at that same strip club in New York, which she did. And you will see, you will hear that those friends confirm those suspicious suspicions. But most importantly, aside from Miss Star Marie Jones, you the reason why it sparked this whole lawsuit, these allegations that the plaintiff claim are def defamation. You will hear direct evidence showing that they are in fact true and the majority of that evidence come from the plaintiff's own mouth her issues of prostitution drug use as far as this allegation of genital herpes none was made what it was an allegation that cold sores said to be passing through that interview but if the plaintiff left it alone at that interview which wasn't a big huge follow-up interview but by the plaintiff commenting making statements to the media she now raised the profile of that video 
So now it becomes more popular. And every time the plaintiff comments on Miss Kebby video or statements, the video garners more and more views. Everyone is familiar with humor. Everyone is familiar with opinion. Everyone needs content in order to appreciate that. So that is what you will get throughout this trial. Ladies and gentlemen, is context. So I beg you to, as the judge said, wait for the evidence to be presented and take all these allegations in the context. And context is not just a statement before, as we know, it's the statement prior and just after. Again, I say, I ask you not to make any judgment about that, what the plaintiff is alleging Miss Kebby said until you actually hear the videos in the context and the context is everything, especially in the media business. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear about the true reason why you're here today. You will hear what is really, what is really it, what it really is that plaintiff is asking you to do to Miss Kebby, Kebby, Mr. Kebby and their company. You will see a video from the plaintiff, plaintiff discussing this issue, alleging things also untrue, but not at issue today, but not at issue today. That Miss Kebby is harassing her friends and the like. Mind you, these will be the same friends you will hear when one, when the ones that plaintiff instructed Miss Kebby to follow up with, which she did. No matter, because she followed up with them, she classified it as harassing her friend, which her friends, which she stated was far too far and because I can't put my hands on you. I'm going to sue you for defamation of character. So what you're really going to be asked is to hear today by the plaintiff is to put your hands on these people. That is what you're going to find, ladies and gentlemen, is that Miss Kebby has no malice had no malice in this case. Mr. Kebby, by continuing to allowing the videos to stay up, also had no malice in this case. And at the end, once you hear all the statement and their, their proper context, you will find there is no liability for Miss Kebby, Mr. Kebby, or Kebby Studio. Thank you. All right, thank you. That ends the opening statements, and we'll, we will proceed with the plaintiff's case. Plaintiff can call her first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. As our first witness, we call the defendant, Latasha Kebby. Uh-oh. May we approach briefly? Let me do to be the judge. Where's my judge at? Where did she go? Let me put my leg back in. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Let me go in. There. Let me be the judge. All right. Thank you. That ends the. Oh, sorry. I'm huh? in the wrong spot. Sure. <laughs> I was in the wrong spot. I'm not sure if this is going to go. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to come. Oh, Lord. Up or not, but I did hear something about a criminal history of Star Marie. Star Marie Jones and her and your honor had ruled out any evidence of Star Marie Jones except for the video obviously and I just wanted to bring up bring it up because I don't know if it's going to come out or not from her opening 
It's in the video, Star Marie discusses the history and defendant admitted, excuse me, the defendant admitted to her telling us in the deposition. And that wasn't something the court ruled on. The court ruled Star Marie communications, except for video texts, were out. Not the video we're talking about where Star Marie admitted that she was on parole and wasn't even supposed to be in the state at the time this was all happening. What was that? Uh, I can't even see what that say, y'all. I just wanted to bring it up for the record just in case. I don't think there is anything for me to uh, rule on. I don't need you to explain. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Ms. Kebby. It's my understanding that you're getting full vaccine. You're not fully vaccinated. Is that correct? No. So if you will assemble the face shield, then we'll then wear that in lieu of your mask. It's beautiful and uh, you're going to want to keep it. Ms. Kebby. If you would remain standing, the clerk was going to administer the oath, please. Please, please raise, raise your right hand. I was about to say, please raise your right hand. Natasha Tarstina Kebby. Here, herein, having been sworn, duly sworn, was examined and testified as followed. Thank you. Please be seated. Then <laughs> it's not your name for the record. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want us to spell names? Okay. Latasha Kibi, and that's spelled L A T A S H A. My middle initial, oh, I'm sorry. My middle name, Transrena, T R A N S R I A N. Last name, Kibi. K as in kite, E as in elephant, B as in boy, E as in elephant, key B. Is the mic okay? You can lower your little, a uh, little bit, a bit. Thank you. If the chair raises, I can reach the mic. I don't know if the chair raises. Okay, we're good. All right. May I inquire, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Good afternoon, Miss Kebby. Good afternoon. I'd actually like to start by reading some of the stipulated facts in this action into the record, just for some background items. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Stipulated. Do I need to read the numbers out, Your Honor? You mean the stipulation? Yeah. Whatever you, uh, however you want to do it. All right. Miss Kebby was previously known as Latasha Howard. Kebby Studios was formed on or about April 14th of 2018 as a Georgia limited liability company. The defendants, which was defined in this stipulation as Kebby and Kebby Studios, the company produced, hosts, and published videos on YouTube under the moniker Unwind with Tasha K. Defendants advertise and sometimes post these videos on various social media platforms, including Twitter and Instagram. Kebby Studios only has two members, each of whom own 50% of its membership units. Kebby Studios only members are Miss Kebby and Shekna Kebby. Shek Shekna Kebby is Miss Kebby's husband. Kebby is in control of and makes all of the decisions regarding the content that the defendants publish on YouTube and other social media platforms. Defendants own or control the following platforms and websites. UnwindWithTashaK.com, which is defined as the website, Amazon Shop, UnwindWithTashaK, Stream Labs, all of them. The YouTube channel, which is referred to as the main YouTube channel. A second YouTube channel referred to as the Wino Gang podcast, which until April of 2019 was called UnwindTashaK Live. Also, the Patreon page, Patreon.com, Tasha K. 
Now, defendants also own and control the following platforms and or social media accounts slash, um, excuse me, social media handles accounts. The Facebook account, which is Unwind Tasha K, and that's Facebook.com Unwind Tasha K. The Facebook Tasha KB, which is Facebook Tasha KB. The Twitter account with the handle Unwind with Tasha. The Instagram account with the handle at Unwind Tasha K. Now, this account was deactivated on August the 10th of 2018 and was reactivated on October 7th of 2019, as well as the Instagram account Wine is the New Tea. Defendants previously owned and or controlled the following social media platforms or social media handles and accounts, although all of these are now deactivated. And it lists Instagram, all of them. Wow, Tasha and Wine, she had a lot. Defendants publish content and gain more viewers and followers to their media channels and, as a result, more advertising revenue. The defendants receive revenue through advertising on YouTube, as well as from monetization of videos on Patreon and sometimes directly from advertisers. And defendants receive those monies through Patreon, PayPal, Venmo, and direct payments into bank accounts. All right, Ms. Kebby, do you recall publishing a video on September 2nd of 2018? Not off the top of my head. Could you remind me of that video, please? <laughs> sure. Can you pull up Plaintiff 532? I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as Plaintiff 532. Will it show right here? It's shown in a moment. Okay. So it's, so it's only going to be shown on the witness screen. Are y'all controlling to show controlling to show this screen? It's connected to plaintiff's back table. Why are you looking at me? Uh, I didn't hear you, Your Honor. I said, are you going to? <laughs> I said, why are you looking at me? <laughs> oh, I thought you were saying something. I'm sorry. Mm -mm. No, no, I was talking to her. So I get <laughs> no, 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 no. off the chain. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> no, no, no. So I guess so uh, we were waiting for it um to show up on this witness screen. Yeah. Could we actually sidebar? I just have one quick question with counsel. Okay, so a lot of these videos have actually been authenticated by request for admission and were admitted. So I guess I just wanted to know how you would like me to handle, would like me to put requests for admission into evidence? I would just simply say, just say, you know, like, uh, Your Honor, we're about to use a video. <laughs> yeah. Your Honor, we're already, already stipulated that it's. Okay. I object. Um, it's to fund foundation. You're not? No. Well, then. She's already admitted that she. Just say, Your Honor, exhibit whatever it is is a video that parties have agreed that foundation is proper that's the video in the mission without further foundational evidence and if i hear no objection i'll say you can publish the video and i'll admit it and even if you want to play it it's got to be tendered you're tendering the exhibit so the same thing i guess you're agreeing to it is being admitted to. Correct. Yeah, there's only a couple where there might be for impeachment only, but that's not going to be this one or the next one. Maybe we can talk about, the only question I had about that is how you handle it in terms of like showing the jury or not showing the jury. 
if only being offered for impeachment, because usually impeachment evidence doesn't move in, but the jury can hear it. I just wanted to raise that before I get too far into my questioning. If the video is going to be played for the jury to see, it still needs to be admitted into evidence for impeachment purposes. So I don't agree with that. It still is admitted for impeachment. Just wouldn't be admitted with the case in chief unless you have used it for use it for impeachment. Then it become and then it comes into because the juror could decide what what mm, did the video say? Was she really impeached? That could go back unless admitted. Uh it's the impeachment that makes it admissible, admissible. Not that it's not admitted. It's still admitted, just any other document, just like any other document. Same reason. You're hundred percent right. I apologize. I misspoke. My thinking was the document. Oftentimes the witness looks and then they're impeached. Then the court lets you move it in. Is she going to view the piece first? Uh, you would ask her, I suppose, did you say something? And she would say, no, I didn't. And then at that time, at that point in time, you lay the foundation of the video. And if it stipulated the foundation, then you move into evidence for purpose of impeachment. And if I would grant, and if I, no, I'm sorry, and I would grant the motion and then it would be shown. Stipulate, stipulate the video as far as foundation is concerned. I'm not sure which. Um, I don't know what you're referring. I don't think it's, um, I do think it was the majority of them. And it's not going to come up right now. So we can deal. Okay. Before this starts, in September of 2018, the first time you ever published a video about my client, Cardi B. No, ma'am. Uh, Tasha. <laughs> Where'd she go? I don't know. Oh, Lord. Okay. Jim. Well, she said no, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So what your, what your attorney just said in this opening statement, that that was the first time, was not true, correct? I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. So what your attorney just said about September of 2018, then the first time you ever published a video about my client, that's not true? Objection, your honor. It's a mis it's misstatement of fact. It's what? I'm sorry, it's what? <laughs> misstatement of facts. What is he Objection is overruled. <laughs> That's the question? Go ahead. That is not correct, no ma'am. Okay. No. It's not the first time you've ever published a video about my client, correct? No. No. Okay. Do you recall the approximate time frame of the first time you ever okay. published a video about my client? What line are we? One on 85, page 85. 85 on one? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Okay. All right. We're going to show you, excuse me, strike that. I'll withdraw. Was the interview with Star Marie Jones. It wasn't the first time that you published a video saying that my client prostituted, correct? No, ma'am, it was not. I'm sorry. I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry. No, ma'am, it was not. Okay. If we can look at, I'm going to show you what's been pre-marked as Exhibit 532. Your Honor, this was stipulated to as in request for admission number 15. No objection. No, I'm sorry. No. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. 
532 is tended and admitted without objection. Okay. And before the video plays, I'd like to just read one other statement from the request for admission, and that is on, excuse me, not the request for admission, the stipulated facts, and that is on September 2nd of 2018, the defendants published the video on YouTube. Okay, if we can, please look at approximately five minutes and 50 seconds into the video. Maybe start like 10 seconds before that. Your Honor, would you want to, I'm sorry, it looks like we're having a couple of technical difficulties trying to get the video queued up. Were you planning on taking a restroom break anytime soon? Because I don't want to waste anybody's time. I really wasn't planning on doing it so quickly, but I will. I just don't want to. All right. We'll go ahead and take a 10 minute recess and come back. Maybe our technology, technology will co cooperate. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to go downstairs to the concession, then feel free to do so. But be back in approximately uh, 10 minutes. Now, All rise. No, oh. wait, I'm not finished. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Now, one thing I didn't... I didn't tell you yesterday, you may have discovered already that there are, there is a refrigerator here for you to use so you can bring stuff with you if you like to. But in the meantime, if someone wants to run downstairs for a few minutes, that's fine. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. All rise. Am I excused? Just a couple of things. One allude to yesterday. If you haven't supplied us with your request to charge, we need those. Re really, we, we are supposed to have them yesterday, but you need to go ahead and send them, send those to us if you have it. And y'all have got to get your technology together. I mean, you can't, uh, this got to be seamless if you're going to have any chance of trying this this case, trying this case without, uh, you know, problems down the road, but I'll trust y'all will be able to do that. But let's get our act together if you can, technology wise. All right, we'll have ten minute recess. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, so we're going to Miss Kibby. We're going to play you a portion of Plaintiff's 532 moved into evidence starting at approximately five minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, thank you. In this video, you just said that my client prostituted for a living, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's not the only time that you had made that statement in videos that were published on the internet, correct? No, ma'am, it's not. Okay. That statement was also made contained in the September 19, 2018 video. Is that correct? Which video are you referring to, please? The interview with Star Marie Jones. Was that? No, ma'am. Not in that particular video. Okay, hold on. I will rephrase the question. Was the statement that my client was a prostitute also contained in the interview with Star Marie Jones? Yes, ma'am. All right. And isn't it true that you found out about Star Marie Jones through another blogger called Lovely T? Yes, ma'am. And you called Lovely T and then reached out to Star Marie. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And isn't it true that you also admitted during your deposition that your fans were not actually asking you to do this video? I don't recall what exactly you're saying. Could you give me more context, please? Why don't we take a look at your deposition transcript? Your Honor, may I approach? Your I'm Honor. Sorry. I'm sorry. I am. Um, I'm on the, I have to go from page to page to try to catch up to y'all. Um, all right, go ahead, ma'am. 
Okay. All right. Isn't it true that you had heard about Star Marie through a video that she had previously published? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you testified that no one asked you to do the video of her, is that correct? I don't recall my exact statement. Please take a look at page 188. Excuse me. No, page 189. Okay. okay. Can you please read lines two through six into the record? Did you have people reaching out to you at that point asking you if you would do the interview for her, of her? Were your fans asking for that? No, nobody asked me to. Thank you. All right. And based on the content of the prior video that you had seen of Star Marie Jones, you knew that Star Marie Jones was saying that my client, Cardi B, was a prostitute had used cocaine, and had herpes. Isn't that true? Objection. Your Honor, that's a compound question. <laughs> <laughs> you, why don't you break it to parts if you would? <laughs> sure. Based on the content of the prior video that you saw of Star Marie Jones, hmm. isn't it true that you knew that Jones was saying that my client, Cardi B, was a prostitute? I don't remember her saying that she was a prostitute. I remember other statements. If you could please look at page 189 of your deposition transcript. Okay. You were asked, isn't it true that you were asked, starting on line 21, you knew based on the content of the original Jones video, that Jones was alleging that our client was a prostitute, right? Answer, yes. yes. Did you give that testimony? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And by Jones that we were discussing during this deposition, we're talking about Star Marie Jones, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. And it's also true that you knew that Jones was making statements that our client was using illegal drugs like cocaine. Isn't that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you also knew that Jones was saying my client had herpes, correct? Cold source to be exact. Miss Kebby, <laughs> I'm going to refer you to your deposition transcript, page 190, line nine, beginning at line nine. Okay, and you knew that our um, that Jones was alleging that our client had herpes. Answer: Yes. Is that the testimony you gave? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And is it also true that when you decided to interview her, you decided to interfer interview her about those topics? Yes, ma'am. Isn't it also true? that the Star Marie Jones video was pre-recorded. Yes, ma'am. So you knew all of the content that was going to be in the video you posted to the internet before you posted it, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you recall testifying that one of the things you wanted to do was drop that video before anyone debunked it? Yes, ma'am. And you also recall testifying that you wanted to get it out before someone else dropped information that might have contradicted the video, correct? I don't remember the context. I re I can't recall. Could you add more context to that, please? Wow. I'm asking if you recall giving that testimony in this case during your deposition. I don't recall. Okay. If you can, please look at your transcript, page 281. I'm going to begin at line 10. You said line 10? Uh-huh. Actually, I'm going to begin at line 5. Okay. You were asked, okay, and do you also recall that one of the things you said was that you wanted... Your Honor, objection. This is improper impeachment. The witness said she did not recall. I think she just asked her to look at the transcript, right? <laughs> it can be laughed. 
So what's improper about that question? She should refresh her recollection, not read it into record. What? She asked her if she knew. She said she couldn't recall. So now she's asking her to look at what she testified previously. Wow. She's just reading the statement into record. <laughs> Objection overruled. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Wow. Beginning at line five. Okay. And do you also recall that one of the things that you said was that you wanted to drop it before anyone debunked it? Answer. Yes, of course. I wanted to get it out if someone was going to debunk it. So yes. Question. Okay. So you wanted to get it out before somebody else dropped information that might be contradicting the video. Answer. Yes, absolutely. Did you give that testimony? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall giving that testimony that one of the reasons you wanted to drop it first was in order to get ratings? Yes, ma'am. And that your decision to publish it had more to do with the fact that you wanted to make money off of it and get the most ratings, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. If we can please pull up Plaintiff's 534. It's a video. And Your Honor, I represent that this has been stipulated by request for admission number 19. What was the number again? Uh, the number of the exhibit of the number of the request for admission. That request to admit, I'm sorry, the exhibit number? The exhibit is Plaintiff 534, Your Honor. All right. Hearing no objection, 534 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Well, can we stop at, after this line 25? Because uh, Sure. Okay. okay. We're going to start this one from the beginning. Done. All right, guys. Just remember, we're on page 94, starting at 1. Okay, guys? Okay. All right. Um, tomorrow, time is best for everyone. Mm. Um, it'll have to be evening. Okay, evening around. Let's do a little bit earlier than today. Yeah, maybe around six. 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 Who's time? <laughs> oh, EST. So what time is Standard that? time. I don't. Let me see. I have to oh, Google five, and see. Five my time. I think. Yes. Six Eastern Standard Time is what Pacific? Let's see. I that would be three o'clock my time. Yeah. I could do four o'clock my time. All okay, right. then it then would be seven. seven. For seven. Us, or, it would be seven for it would be seven for us. Yes. Right. And six for Central. 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 Yeah. Okay. So seven Eastern. Okay. All right, guys. This uh this was really um enjoyable. Thank you guys for <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> it was fun, it was funny, and it was crazy all at the same time. All at the same time. Lord. So, Chad, what are you saying? <laughs> That's an objection. <laughs> wow. Guys, hopefully tomorrow will be a little bit better often the, the Russian will mess with our computers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we need to come into StreamYard first to uh, yeah. make sure StreamYard right. is working. Yeah. So come in a little early. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for everybody. Please share and um, subscribe. We will continue this um, episode, and we're going to call it reenactment of the trial, Cardi B trial. So just for everyone of you guys, have a wonderful night. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please hit the like button, subscribe, help a sister out, okay, guys? And we'll right. be back tomorrow, which is 7 Eastern Standard Time, six Central Standard Time, five Mount. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know the numbers anymore. Four Pacific Standard. Yeah. Six Central. Seven. What is Eastern. seven? Eastern. Eastern. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Have a good night. We'll see you guys tomorrow, and right. uh, we'll have everybody in place and all our readers, so you can know that I won't be the judge. Everybody. <laughs> 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 Hey, she was fighting with herself. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh.
What you say, fool? <laughs> <laughs> I pity a fool. I pity Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. Good All night. Right. And why not? I hope you guys enjoyed yourself. <laughs> All right. Good night. You'll like everybody. it tomorrow. Yeah. Good, good night. night good night. Mm -hmm. All right. Stay in here for a minute. Ooh, they dropped off. Okay.